I have never before had two people that have had lung transplants. So uh, before we start with your talking about your artwork, and then you are going to comment about whether his artwork represents your lived experience. Talk because I don't really know the difference between your two conditions. I know about cerebral um, yeah. cystic fibrosis. So yeah, uh, I have cystic fibrosis. I was born with cystic fibrosis. Um, diagnosed three months after I was born in 1982. Obviously, um, things have come a long way over the last 40 years. Um, <clears throat> in 2011, I was told by my cystic fibrosis team I should seek a uh, transplant consultation. So I did that at USC at Keck's, uh, Keck Medicine, uh, Keck Hospital at USC in Los Angeles, and they confirmed I should get a transplant. So I flew to Boston, where I'm from, and got a third opinion at the center I was going to, Boston Children's Hospital. Um, that's where I went through my teen years. Um, I, the doctor I trusted most uh, with CF care was there, Dr. Euler. I had him talk to me about it. He agreed I probably wouldn't last four years with the lungs that I had. And coincidentally, four years after that consultation, I had my transplant. Um, so yeah, that's where, I, where I'm coming to this talk from that. And so my history is a little bit different in that I didn't have cystic fibrosis. Um, I did have respiratory diseases uh, or respiratory illnesses, significant illness as a young child. Uh, I, before I was one, I had pneumonia six or eight times and was really sick as a kid. And then I went through a period in my teens and 20s where you really couldn't tell that I had lung disease. In elementary school, I missed a bunch of school and they always told my mom that I wouldn't be able to keep up with other kids and such. But yet high school and college, I swam competitively, I danced competitively, I cheered competitively. And so my mom just kind of let me do. I knew I had lung disease, but it was- Do they have a name? They didn't. They called it chronic bronchitis or bad asthma. And that's all they, they called it. Um, and then I started to get sick and my respiratory illness was always a background thing. You know, I had a chronic cough, much like Dominic, I could produce sputum on demand, you know, that sort of thing, but it really didn't limit me. And in my 30s, I started to have more problems. And by my 40s, I was on a pretty steep downhill slide. I've got you beat by about 15 to 18 years. Uh, so um, by the time I was in my 40s, I was on uh, chronic therapies, antibiotics, the vest treatments, had some hospitalizations, uh, went on oxygen for the first time in 2009, never came off of it. At, at night only, I was still working full time as an emergency department physician. Um, and then by 2016, I was to the point I was on oxygen almost 24 seven. I carried my little pack with me around the hospital. Um, was diagnosed with bronchiectasis sometime in that time period. They finally gave my disease a name. Uh, went through all the testing, <clears throat> excuse me, looking for CF and some of the other diseases, genetic diseases that cause bronchiectasis, because bronchiectasis is the end result of the lung disease that cystic fibrosis patients get. Um, but they never found a reason for my bronchiectasis. So in medical terms, I am bron bronchiectasis NOS, not otherwise specified. Um, my uh, time on the transplant list was a little bit different. I went for my evaluation a couple of years before and was told, oh no, you've got plenty of time because I looked great. I looked terrible on paper, but I looked great in person. And then when I finally got listed, I was only on the transplant list for about eight, nine days because I was that sick at that point. Wow. And you, you were down to about 10%? Um, I just want to make a quick comment. My official reason for transplant was bronchiectasis, um, which is funny because, you know, everyone assumes it's cystic, cystic fibrosis, but the, the, um, the reason why I wasn't, you know, exchanging gases and all that stuff was bronchiectasis. Um, yeah, when I, well, when I was listed for transplant originally, the, the, uh, the first, um, the reason why I went on the list, uh, my P 
PFTs were around 28%, which is pretty high for transplantation. I was listed because um, my antibiotic resistance were almost across the board, and they were concerned I was going to run out of any kind of um, ability to fight infections e either in the immediacy or if I was to make it to transplant, post-transplant, not having any antibiotic reserves to fight infections. So they listed me early. Um, I wasn't on oxygen at the time. Uh, a year later, I ended up on oxygen full time, and um, but my total wait time was three and a half years. Um, I ended up getting listed at USC and at Stanford after being in a coma for five days with acute lung failure at USC. Um, got an offer for lungs that were slightly punctured, so they denied those. I was somehow recovered from that, like right before they put me on ECMO. My wife advocated for me, don't put him on ECMO, just give him a, like one more day. And luckily in that 24 hours, I was able to come out of the coma, breathe on my own. Then a month later, I went up to Stanford. We drove up to Stanford and they kind of took over my transplant care at that point. And I was eventually transplanted um, at Stanford. Um, so, yeah. But you didn't think, when you finally had the transplant, what was your... Oh, yeah, so I was down to, yeah, about 15, 14, 15% lung function when I was transferred, transplanted. So the pulmonary function testing looks at a lot of different factors, and the thing that they look at the most is called the FEV1, and it's the amount of air that you can express in um, the first few seconds and then minute uh, ventilation and such. And my FEV1 was down to 11% before transplant. Low. Very low. All right, so we're gonna look at Dominic's art and you can talk about the creation, you can talk about whatever, whatever it brings to mind for you. So this is one that was off your Instagram account, I think. So Dominic does a lot of different work. He paints, but he also uses social media to sort of explain what his life is like. And especially when he was very sick, he posted a lot on social media. So why don't you talk about this, and then maybe you can talk about the realities of knowing there's part of somebody else kicking around inside. Yeah, so I, I um, yeah, I started off as a painter. Well, I, before that, I started off as a sociologist because my whole family was telling me you can't do anything with art. And so I was like, I'll be a social worker because that makes total sense. But um, anyway, so I, I was painter. Um, and then as my health declined, I wasn't able to build the painting structures that I was uh, building throughout my practice. So I transitioned into doing more performative work using my body, then got into video art. And um, I was just in the hospital more and more and more and I, I to the point where I, um, I was making art and having exhibitions in my hospital space. And then I started using social media as a way to kind of broadcast art that I was making that wasn't able to get out into the public like I had in previous uh, years. So this is one that I did um, shortly after my transplant. Um, probably actually while I was still inpatient um, making it and then uh, making it on my phone with like a, a, a stylus and then putting it up on Instagram and, um, you know, they, the, I was at the time just thinking like these little poetic sayings or notions that I was feeling during this recovery where I was up at Stanford living there for three months uh, away from my family and friends uh, in both in Massachusetts and Los Angeles, um, feeling a, a bit isolated, uh, not having my studio near me. So I didn't have a lot of the materials I normally work with. So I started going into more video and digital works. And um, I, I kind of kept up that community, that art community that I had by putting stuff on social media and getting feedback and interaction that way. And this was just one of the, that, that slogans that, that kind of hit me, that like poetry. Um, cause the, the transplant process is so emotional. It's, it's like, and you probably had this experience. It's, um, it's like so emotional. It kind of short circuits, everything, your, your brain, your thinking, you get a lot of brain fog. You get a lot of emotional issues from the prednisone and 
the prograph and all as your meds get regulated you're emotionally so high you're getting the most attention you've ever gotten in your life people you've known since you know that you used to know in like kindergarten or finding you online like facebook send you messages like i heard you had a transplant like i'm surprised you're still alive to be to begin with and you like <laughs> you got all these people that never thought i would live past you know 12 years old or 15 years old or you know congratulating and all this weird stuff but you're also dealing with the fact that somebody passed away and you got their organs so it's like this notion, like I, I don't have my original lungs, but I'm still alive. How does that work? And you're factoring in the, the in processing that you have a, a dead person's organs and that's how you're staying alive. And, and, and it, it hits you really hard. And, and it's these moments where, you know, you might be, you know, washing the dishes or watching TV or going for a drive and, and the, the emotions kind of come up and get you. Did you have that like similar experience? Yeah. I did, and when you were talking about you know the realization that somebody, somebody's dead organ, someone who's dead's organs are living in you, um, you know, to hear him say that he was on the list for three and a half years kind of hit me hard, because I had eight days that I had to think about the fact that, you know, I I wasn't I they they told me when I went into the hospital because I went into the hospital I work New Year's Eve, and went into the hospital I got off at midnight and I went into the hospital at four a.m on New Year's Day and never left until the end of March. So I was in January, February, and March of 2017. And that first six weeks of my hospitalization was all about getting me ready and doing all this test. I had every test known to mankind done in a six week period. Um, and when they told me they were listing me, they said to me, we think that you'll, you're sick enough that you'll get lungs really quickly. And then I was like, okay, you know, two days, three days, and then day four, day five, day six. And I'm like, what happened to quickly? At that point, I was on 50, five, zero liters of oxygen per minute via a cannula in my nose. When they send you home, you, you're on like two, four, maybe six at the most. My concentrator went to 10. That was the maximum my concentrator went to. I was on 50. And so they made it clear that I had two options. I was going to die in the hospital or I was going to go home with new lungs. There were no other alternatives. And, and so when they listed me, how do you pray for lungs? I am a religious person, but how do you hit with the reality that somebody else has to die for you to live? And how do you ask your deity for that? And so I have a, have a very wise friend that I was saying this to, and she said to me, she, re, she said, you're thinking about it wrong. You have to reframe it. You're not asking for somebody else to die. That's already in the plans. They're going to die anyway. What you're asking for is their family to make the decision to donate their organs and for those organs to be suitable for you. And so that did reframe it for me. Um, but yeah, the whole idea of the only way I'm going to live is if somebody else dies is a really difficult concept to wrap your head around. When you guys get got your new lungs, like I, the only thing I can even, like I had a spleen out, but nobody, nothing put in. And I think of like when I had my wisdom teeth taken out and you kept taking your tongue and feeling where, did you guys sit there and listen and go, my breath sounds different, my, like what's it like after wheezing? Because I knew you before that and you were, <gasps> you know. Well, we were we were talking about this in the back gallery here. The the notion or the, like the romanticized hallmark moment of the transplant is you come out of surgery and like two minutes later you're and your makeup's taking that, perfect. You're taking that big breath and it's glorious and, and that doesn't happen. Like to the point where my first breath, I started crying and asking my nurse, my wife my doctor, did I actually have the transplant or was it a false alarm? Because my breathing was actually worse, which is understandable. I mean, the lungs were on ice, they were somebody else's, now they're inside of me and all this stuff. And um, my, my transplant was 13 hours because I was, uh, I had so much scar tissue from some surgeries I had as a kid. I had a partial lobectomy and that kind of grabbed, the scar tissue grabbed the lung. So it took a long time and a lot of in, uh, blood transfusions while, while they were cutting that lung out. 
and, and all that stuff has to heal. And it took me probably two weeks to have that really big, nice breath. And um, probably 45 days before my PFTs were at their, their peak. And, um, but I still, I still have never been able to run a marathon or do all that stuff like, you know, I, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, so my uh, my lung transplant was actually Super Bowl Sunday, 2017. Oh, so, he was watching the Super Bowl. I know that. <laughs> so we we call it Super Lung Sunday, affectionately now. Um, and so I just had my six year anniversary. So. Uh, I was in the hospital about six weeks afterwards. Um, one of the other differences in ours, they woke him up immediately after surgery. They left me intubated for 24 hours and then extubated me on Monday. Um, and we were joking, the day after you get extubated, you're up and walking. I mean, they, you are, they get you moving right away. And, and I thought... Is that so no, no fluid builds up in the lungs? Yeah, it's a, you know, we're so deconditioned at that point that it takes a lot. And laying down on your back is the worst position for your lung function. So getting people up and moving and when you walk, you have to take di bigger breaths. You can get a lot of lung collapse, which is called atelectasis if you're not breathing deeply. So they really push you to do activities and be upright in a chair and be moving. Um, but I expected it, I think, to be a little more like you were describing where you take that first breath and it's like, wow. And that is so not the reality. And I haven't talked to anybody that that was the reality for. Um, I, it took me almost a month to get off oxygen. It took me a long time to learn to trust my lungs because I'm sure you had the same thing before the transplant. If anything stressed me, not only would my SATs bottom out, but I would get that air hunger and that panic feeling where you're like, oh gosh, this is it. And, and that adrenaline surge and your whole body gets warm and your face tingles and you cannot breathe and you feel like you're drowning. And every, I had that sensation all the time for the first week or so. And then it, you know, would get better and better. But every time that sensation came up, it, it was like, this wasn't worth it. It's, it. It didn't work. It didn't happen. And it really took... It took me close to a month to get to the point where I could routinely breathe easily. And if I got short of breath, not panic. Yeah, yeah so I, with my CF lungs, I had a long history of hemoptysis, which is coughing up blood, like not just like spitting blood, but cups and cups where it doesn't stop. And that's the reason why I had some of those surgeries when I was younger, but to your point, um, I had this sensation of like, it sounded like you put, like took a gallon of water and filled it halfway and then swished it around. Like I would have that feeling and sound when I would breathe for the first like maybe eight to 10 days after my transplant. And it would send me into a panic because I thought that it was homoptysis. I thought it was my lungs filling up with blood. And it was this constant, that panic. And um, I got off oxygen pretty fast. I, it was like seven days, um, which, is, which is pretty fast after transplant. Um, but even off, even off oxygen, like taking a breath, doing the laps around the ICU and being like, like just trying to find uh, a nurse or somebody like saying like, I think I'm, I think I'm coughing up blood or I, you know, something's wrong, something disconnected. Cause you don't, you like some, like, people were inside your chest cavity. It's like hard to explain what it's like to have somebody reach inside of you. And then, you know, you're expected to like, just go to rehab and go home. It's really wild. Well, let's talk about these pieces, which are some of my favorite you've done. They're really simple. Were these done before or after? So these, I, this series I made while I was in the hospital pre-transplant, um, I called them intersecting bodies. And I was thinking about this idea of two physical bodies occupying the same space at the same time. And really the only way to do that is through tr organ transplantation. So I have these bodies like kind of colliding and intersecting at specific points. And I did these while I was inpatient getting um, treatment for a CF exacerbation. These were done 
for a show that Ted and I were in actually at um, a gallery called The Situation Room in Los Angeles. So I was making these works um, for April and I had the transplant three months later. These are painted on, these are acrylic on the isolation gowns that the nurses would have to wear when they came into my hospital room. I wanted to use the materials that I was familiar with um, that kind of represented my experience as a patient to make these works and that, that sensation of, you know, sharing physical space with other physical matter, which is, you know, not something our brains really can compute that well. How do they look to you? Do you, do you have these, like, do you guys sit there at night and, I mean, there's the whole issue of the other person had to die, but part of them is still alive in you. Do you, is this something that crosses your, your thoughts all the time as you're fading off at night? It does. You know, it's one of those things where um, I, don't, I don't think about my transplant every minute, every day now. I'm thankfully doing really well. And so it's not in the forefront of my consciousness like it was the first, you know, several couple years. Um, but it's certainly something that is always with me. And when I saw, especially the picture on the left where the second person is directly through the chest cavity, I was like, oh my gosh, you know, that is such a great, in my mind, expression of exactly what I'm embodying. You know, that my, my transplant, uh, my donor was a 21 year old boy named Justin. And I very often refer to him and I get emotional talking about him. So yeah, that's beautiful. It's funny, I have med students come to my studio in LA and they, they have these vision exercises because I have a big art collection. And they, you know, a lot of times I'll ask them what they think different ones are about. And, and yours, some of them get transplant, but a lot of them are like, it's ghosts. They're ghosts and in kind of a way, you know, they are. Do you want to say something about them? Well, I, I just, I had the, I guess, unusual experience uh, for a patient to be on the list for three and a half years, but also like a very rich and um, amazing experience as an artist to be on the list that long and kind of work through these different scenarios. And this was one of those series I made that I was kind of meditating on what it would be like. Um, I kind of always felt like I was going to get a transplant, which is, I don't know if that's a privilege thing or not, but, um, so, and so like, these are kind of like meditations on, on what it was going to be like, but th this is kind of how I felt like it would emb embody. So. And what I really like about these is that, you know, a lot of times people think paintings have to be super technical. You have to be, not that you're not a good painter, but they think you have to be a great painter. These are pretty simple and they're awfully powerful. Yeah. You know, let's see what's next. So I'm gonna go through the next four images. And these are all ones that Dominic did in his room. He, you can explain how you uh, use your room as a studio, but I like the fact that he paints sort of the mundane things that you see all the time when you have a chronic illness. Like I look at Dominic's work and go, yeah, I saw that stuff my entire childhood and maybe you can comment from the doctor side too. So I'll, I'll run through them. Why don't you just say what? Yeah, th this is like the, the ice cup that you co come in. And um, I am very fortunate to have a loving wife and before that a loving mom. My mom, mom's still alive. I, that maybe sounds She doesn't weird. love me anymore though. <laughs> right. So they would bring me visual things to keep my room looking nice. One of them being flowers. And they'd always kind of just like look around and grab, grab that picture because it already had melted ice in it and it's, it was all like ready made for flowers. And so that was like a, a thing that would happen. And I was in the hospital a lot, like four times a year for two weeks at a time would be a good year for me most of the time. So, I, you know, like this type of thing. And so I, I painted that one afternoon, but I was like, I want to make it super specific. And so I, kind of did like the graphite rubbing around it to really like 
almost like a camera kind of adjusting and bringing your focus completely onto that one object. And um, yeah, like the, the chair that unfolds, like the convertible chair, and it's like these objects that are in my room, that's the, the title of the series, Objects in My Hospital Room. These things that you become so familiar with because you're around them so much and they become characters in your life. And so I wanted to give them that focus that most people come into a hospital room visiting and you know they plop down on that chair or they look at this clock and it doesn't mean anything to them. But for me, like that clock, watching that hand tick is almost as entertaining as watching, you know, trash TV on, you know, or something like that because it's just that thing that's keeping you company when you're in the hospital all the time and you have a lot of sleeping problems in the hospital and so that clock, I think it's, uh, yeah, 3 a.m. in the morning. So I, I, that's, I painted that at 3 a.m. That just happens, you know, it's like, and then the, the biohazard's the most interesting thing because you got people throwing things in there and then the, the sharps container on top. So. Visually, I thought, you know, all these things had interest too, but there are things that are often overlooked by other, the, by people that aren't patients, that aren't living with these objects for a period of time. And what about you? Like, you weren't in the hospital your whole life like he was, but you saw these things as from the doctor's side. Yeah, so I wasn't in, my, in the hospital my whole life as a patient, but I've been yeah. in the hospital my whole life as a physician. So my relationship with these things was very different than your relationship. My relationship with the ice bucket was the, the patient as I would, do you need anything else? Oh yeah. Can I have more ice? And I would go to the ice machine or whatever and get it for them. Um, you know, the, the sharps container, the biohazard, that's where I put my gown and my gloves and the needle after I injected the patient or whatever. So it, my relationship with those items was very professional until I was in the hospital for three months. And then it did become um, much more personal. Mm -hmm. Did you, you know, about every six months on Terry Gross, there's some doctor who's written a book. Like, I didn't realize what it was like to be a patient until I had to be a patient. Did you go through that? Or were you enlightened ahead of time, I hope? I wasn't enlightened ahead of time, and I didn't want to write a book, but I tried to read When Breath Becomes Air, and I tried to read it about two years or so after my transplant. I couldn't finish it. I still haven't finished it. And so I would, that's on my list of things to go back and finish, but it was too personal for me at that point. Um, I did start speaking about the transplant right away, and I think that that was my way of processing and venting and, in my mind, advocating. Um, because advocacy, advocacy as, a, as a physician, especially emergency physician, is a big part of our lives. And so doing things for the Indiana Donor Network became one of my, you know, I will never say no, ask me to do anything mantras. And here you are. And here I, but not through the Donor Network, through IU, but thank you for the invitation. All right, let's go through a couple more of Dominic's. Why don't you tell us what's going on in the next few of these? Yeah, so the, this one, um, I had to kind of read it again because um, it says, I've seemed to inadvertently given up art. And this this was, um, so I'm not specifically, I'll, I'll go back a little bit. I was in grad school. So wh when I was listed for transplant, I was already in grad school. I had one year left. I also wasn't married, but the previous, the next year, I graduated grad school and got married all before I had my transplant, um, even though I was listed. So I, I was going through a lot of shit. And I, I was always joking around saying, you know, like, I, I'm scared to have this transplant, not because of the mortality or the science or the violence of it, but the fact that once I lose my CF lungs, am I gonna lose like that creative engine because a lot of the art I was making was about identity through chronic illness and my relationship to these medical materials, hospital gowns and surgical linens and isolation gowns and gloves and things like that. 
And um, so it was kind of like this running joke in grad school, like don't get that transplant because you won't be an artist anymore. And then I had the transplant and it takes so much energy and so much emotional labor to get through that. And I did, I stopped making art um, just for logistical reasons. I didn't have my studio. And, and so I, I, that's when I was like, I gotta push myself into digital painting and the tools I had on hand, which is my phone, my computer, things like that. So I made, I did more performance art. And um, so this, I, I screenshotted the definition of something, like just do something. That was the thing. Like I would talk to my artist friends, like, oh, I'm like, I'm, I was calling it like creative block or what artist block or whatever this just kind of excuses in a way, but I, I just couldn't get it out because a lot of times art is like a, a purging of yourself and I felt like that's exactly what a transplant surgery and recovery is, a purging of self. It's a total identity shift. I was no longer the sick kid that coughed all the time, that was rolling around with the oxygen. I, I painted my oxygen tank to look like a minion. So it, like I was like the guy with the minion following him everywhere. You know, that was my identity for three years. And previous to that, CF with the coughing and, you know, and, and so this, my artist self was like always secondary in a way, but it now had to become in the forefront because I was not as sick, you know, I was not going through those things. So I screenshotted something and I painted, you know, digitally painted on that. And that's kind of like what, you know, get that, that spark, that flicker going again and trying to, rebuild who I was. I had to, I had to, it was like, I call it a second puberty. I had to rebuild the person that I was going to be. Um, yeah, did, did, did you experience that? I, I, yeah. I always wondered. Well, but you changed, uh, you changed careers in a way you had been. Not willingly. Oh, really? Not willingly, yeah. So, you know, if you'd asked me 10 years ago, tell me about you, I would have started with, I'm a doctor. I'm an emergency medicine physician. I work here. Um, I had a lot of um, pride in being a physician and a lot, and I was very proud of where I worked. You know, Riley Hospital for, Hospital for Children, the Eskenazi Wishard system, you know, serves a, a very needy, mostly indigent population. And I, that's the population I loved to serve. So I had a lot of my self-worth and self-confidence was wrapped around the fact that I was a physician that who worked in two very difficult venues, Riley and this indigent patient population. And so um, after the transplant, one of my first questions to my team was, as I was feeling better, like a few months later, um, several months later, I guess it was like August, when can I go back to work? And they're like, what? It's like, when can I go back? You know, I need to be telling them. I, I've been away eight months now. And they said, Deb, you can never go back to clinical medicine in the emergency department. Because of germs? Because of... Yeah. The emergency department is an undifferentiated environment. I have, as an immune compromised patient myself, and I have no idea, you know, the, 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 ch the chief complaint can say chest pain. And I walk in and I'm doing my exam and it's a patient with active TB that doesn't know that they have active TB. I can't, I can't be around that. Um, childhood respiratory viruses can be deadly for people who are immune compromised. So this, uh, not, not to sound rude, but like that didn't, you didn't think about that ahead of time? Didn't cross your mind? It didn't. It didn't. You, part, of, part of what, I, part of the reason I don't think it did is because things happened so quickly for me. I mean, I was, I was working New Year's Eve and in the hospital New Year's Day. And so I knew I had this disease. I knew I was eventually going to go to transplant. I think I was a little bit in denial, which probably was good in that it kept me working and active and all of that. But the denial part of it also didn't let me consider it from an intellectual standpoint for myself, what, what it would mean for me. Um, and so when I asked about going back, they said never pediatrics, nothing to do with pediatrics. And I'm pediatric board certified. 
And I was like, okay, what about emergency medicine? They're like, it's too undifferentiated. You could work in a um, chest pain hospital, like a cardiac hospital, or uh, trauma. Well, no hospital in the world is going to hire me just to see trauma. I'm going to sit in the back hallway and wait for trauma patients to roll in. You know, that doesn't, that doesn't work. Um, they did let me go back to doing IndyCar. I'm one of the physicians for the IndyCar series. Well, the IndyCar drivers, we only treat the drivers. And they're young, healthy athletes, so they are trauma patients. So they let me go back to do that. But that's really the only clinical venue that I'm allowed to do. I work in the Sim Center, but it's plastic patients working with medical students and, and residents. Um, but I had to reinvent myself as a physician because I wasn't allowed to practice clinically. So how long till you decided maybe education would be good or did someone bring the idea to you? So I've always been a medical educator, um, being part of the IU School of Medicine faculty. I was always teaching residents, always teaching students. So it was something that I was doing alongside my clinical activities. Um, and in January of 2018, the IU School of Medicine uh, created a new position that was an assistant dean for career mentoring for the medical students specifically. And I applied for it. And I think my experience, I had a lot of institutional history because I had been part of the medical center faculty since 1998. Um, and I had been a program director and had been involved in medical education at both the undergraduate medical education and the graduate medical ed education levels that um, it was a perfect position for me to transition. But yeah, the, the whole reinventing yourself and wondering about your worth and abilities is definitely something that I went through as well. How long have you started painting with actual paint again? Uh, it was a, it was a, about a year or so. I did, I did these digital paintings. I started slowly getting back into drawings, um, actual paintings about a year or so but then really getting my practice going probably two years. And that's hard to do when you're, you know, art is a attention, uh, an attention business, attention business. And if you disappear for too long, your the tension goes away. So it's been a slow to rebuild that. It, it's, it's happening again, but um, you know, that's, yeah, it was definitely a, a struggle. So you guys can both talk about this one. I don't know what your yeah. what your routine is nowadays. What's yeah, the routine yeah. for somebody with a transplant? Yeah, so this is a drawing made um, graphite and, and then colored pencil. It's, uh, yeah, my immune system is pills, basically. It's, uh, you know, I have, a, I have some, immune, uh, some immune system function, but most of it is supplemented by antibiotics that are taken prophylactically and... Um, so how many pills a day are you on? A lot, probably probably 20. I have more than her because I have cystic fibrosis, so I take enzymes and... It's not a contest. Other things, <laughs> it is. <laughs> it's the suffering Olympics. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, you know, antifungals, antivirals, and stuff like that. I, I don't know, my donor had uh, a few underlying dormant viruses that pa passed on to me now that I'm uh, challenged with. And so sometimes those become active and I have to, I have to treat those. So, you know, it, it ebbs and flows, but about 20 a day is pretty common. And I, I also have chronic rejection. So um, I have three extra things. I do that in an inhaler and a couple other things like that, so. Yeah, and one of the differences even though we both had bronchiectasis, um, which is a chronic scarring and the lungs, the, the little air sacs become big plums rather than little grapes. Um, and you get, you know, stuff stuck and clearing, you, you, what you cough chronically. Um, so we shared that part of it. But since mine wasn't cystic fibrosis, I didn't have all the, the digestive issues and all that that go along with CF as well. So um, I'm on 23 pills a day. So you may have to recount. You'll have to, you probably are beating me still though. Um, uh, but it's mostly, oh my gosh, my anti-rejection is 12 of those 
pills, three different medications. And then a couple days a week, there are extra pills. So 23 is the max. Uh, four days a week, it's 20. And three days a week, it's 23. But I don't have to do the inhalers and, and all of that yeah. at this point. All right. So now we're to some of your paintings. And I think these were before, right? These are Yeah, prepping. these were pre-transplant. Yeah, I wanted to do a series that kind of um, commented on image crafting, which is a, is a concept based around social media where you just present this positive image to the public. So they're in the square format like a post on Instagram. But instead of projecting this positive, you know, I'm always on the, in the Caribbean, I'm always, you know, winning the lottery, all, you know, new car, or whatever. Uh, it's the experience of someone with a chronic illness. So you're getting your blood drawn from the first person perspective, you know, my arm getting blood taken. And um, so th that's kind of what these, these paintings were about. Some more, um, this one's uh, laying, uh, I, lo I love this painting because it was uh, laying in the ICU, and you kind of sometimes feel like you're this anonymous blob of human cells laying there, and you know you get kind of hot. So I took my leg out. It, I abstracted this one a little because I wanted you to not necessarily know exactly what's going on, but you kind of see it in the photo. But on the leg that's exposed, there's hairs that I cut off my own leg, and then I glued them on or mixed them with the paint. So to me, this painting represents like the anonymity of being in the hospital and being like a patient number from medical record, right? And you're just a wristband to the nurses, like where's your, you know, you scan the wristband. But if you actually went deeper and did research, you could do a DNA test on the hair and identify that was ag exactly me as the patient. And so it's, it's kind of playing with, with that notion. Comments? No comments? I didn't. You knew their names? I knew, well, I knew their names. <laughs> I didn't have to scan their wristbands. The is different. Yeah. Well, but, but you're right. You do, you know, the, the first thing the nurses do when they walk in the room is you, you just automatically get to the point you go like this. Yeah. Because you know that that's what they want. They want the wristband before they can do anything else or, or want anything else from you. Um, but the, the anonymity in the ICU is, is interesting because I can remember, and I was in the ICU um, two different times during my stay post-transplant, but the first time was for three weeks. And I got to the point where I was almost afraid to be alone at night because I had some ICU psychoses. I was seeing things and people in my room that weren't there. Um, and I would push the nurse call button and I have no idea what the time interval was because I had lost total, con total uh, any conception of time. Um, and I would push it and nobody would respond. And I would feel like I would doze off or something in it. I would be like, it's been an hour and I would push it again, you know, because I, I had to have them for the bedpan or I couldn't roll over on my own, that sort of thing. And I can remember feeling like I am so alone. I will say that my best friend, my mom and my husband did a really good job of making sure that I was rarely alone, especially through my psychoses. Um, because I think they realized I needed that familiarity. And, but the very first night I spent by myself in the ICU, I still remember being very scared because I felt like I was so alone. So you guys can, I mean, you weren't as sick as a kid and you were, you were pretty sick as a kid. I was pretty sick as a kid. Can, can you talk to the idea of making other people comfortable? Like I, I always talk about part of our job and we're gonna talk about your suit before the end of this is especially when you're a kid, you have, people want to feel compassion for you, but you can't be too sick, and then you're just annoying to them. Like the idea of being yeah. acceptably sick to make the other people around you comfortable. Yeah, I mean, I definitely relate to that. I, I know that, um, you know, having CF, you're in the hospital, and when I, I was growing up in the 80s and 90s, they didn't have the three feet, then six feet rule. It was a free-for-all, so I was hanging out with CF patients, I became best friends with CF patients and my friend Jen was the whiner or the complainer or whatever you want to call her 
the non-compliant, whatever. I thought she was just self-advocating, but the nurses were annoyed with her, the doctor, you know, whatever. She was a problem, but I didn't, as a fellow patient, I thought, I wish I had her, you know, I wish I could speak up for myself like she did, but I just sat there and took it. You know, I would let an IV nurse dig around because she couldn't find a vein, and my friend Jen would be like, get out of here, you know, get somebody else, and, you know, so, like, yeah, that's a thing for sure, and I, I was the the guy who, you know, I would try to make everyone laugh, and if you missed my vein, I'd say that's fine, even though I'm, like, dying inside, you know. So from the doctor's side, when you were working with kids, because I just, I have really distinct memories as a kid of, like, thinking, I have to not act too sick. And I was in a lot of pain. But if, if I acted too sick, then the adults were like, oh, he's, you know, they, they'd come up and rub your head and go, oh, he's, you're going to be OK, kid. And, but if you acted really sick, they were like, I just, they didn't want to deal with the realities of a sick kid. You mean, you mean people out in public? Public or even, I could see the difference from the nurses, too. From, Sometimes when I would come in, I'd be in really bad shape to when I started getting better. Yeah, I, you know, I think, um, I think one of the things with chronic illness that, that people worry about, and even with kids, is um, I can't act really sick or they won't take me seriously. And so I think, you know, the whole um, drama Part of it, it came into play, you know, the few times that I was in the hospital as a kid. And I can remember as a physician in the emergency department having nurses who would come out and not want to deal with a child who has chronic pain or a chronic illness um, and not being as patient or compassionate as I felt like they should be with it. But then, you know, we'd have another kid in the very next room who had something minor that they would be all over. And so I think I understand, I understand what you are getting at with the you can't play up the sick role. It's um, off-putting and more isolating. Um, but, you know, that's something that I think is a good lesson for healthcare providers and what we should be teaching young physicians and nurses. Yeah, I think I got a lot of extra pudding because I had dimples when I was a kid. Well, I wonder if it has to do with a little bit with rationality, like... When somebody seems irrational, they it, it's hard. I think doctors especially are very rational beings. So it's hard to relate to irrationality. And so like one, there was one time I was having severe headaches as a side effect of one of the medications. And I'm normally very a very rational patient. Like, okay, if, if I have to wait a little, I, I wait a little. If I, whatever, you know, like I can work with them. But this one time I just, I couldn't, stand it and I needed something and I, I started screaming and people ran in and they were like what's going on and like it was like a total freak out like security had to come and and it was like I, and I then I started feeling embarrassed not in the moment because I was so much in, in so much pain but after the fact and so I, I don't know like there, I don't know if there's an answer to that question but I, I'm just just like a, an idea like maybe that's part of it I don't know yeah, I just, I, I don't know, I just brought it up. It just sort of reminded, it reminded me of a story <laughs> with me where I had, had, I had had my hip replaced and when they did it, they sort of tweaked my back and I, I think it was two days afterward and they had the egg crate on my bed and it was too soft. So I took my crutches, I lowered myself on the floor and I was laying on the floor in the room. The nurse walks by, sees my feet on the floor and all of a sudden, they run in with a crash cart. And I'm just sitting there watching TV on the floor. But they were very upset. I don't know anything about this. This is your new work. Why don't you tell us yeah, about it? Yeah, these are new. I started making these last, last spring, so about a year ago. Um, these are I call these transformers. So the top left, where it's flat, is uh, one iteration. That's like how it exists on the wall. And they're, um, the, the limbs move. It, so it's um, hospital gowns on wood with hinges. So the viewer is allowed and in, in, um, invited to come in and move them and repose them, reposition them, transform them. And to me, this is just kind of an act 
of participation to kind of get an experience, like a, almost like a psychic experience of interacting with, um, a, you know, just pretty obviously a patient wearing a hospital gown. But also the fact that we're beings that are changing constantly, especially as patients. There's not ever a time where a cr person with a chronic illness isn't in a different state. And so you can come in, you see this on the wall, you pose it differently and then you leave. So then somebody else comes in and they see it and they pose it differently. So it can be a different visual every time you come in and then you interact with it and you impose something onto it and you affect it. And so that's kind of what this series is, is thinking about and, and working with. So the bottom right, and maybe this is just because you were talking about it, looks like ribs yeah. being spread. Is yeah. that yeah. part of what the imagery came from? Yeah, sure. I think I think it always comes out. I don't. I didn't have the intention at first, um, but it, I think it kind of ends up working its way into the to the work for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Th this um, this is a drawing. So I, st I I obviously spend a lot of time at clinics and uh, this material that I'm really familiar with, the tissue paper that you sit on and it crinkles and it crunches and it, uh, it's very absorbent and it's meant to just rip off and throw away repeatedly, right? It's like uh, a small minor barrier between the patient and the hospital or exam table. And um, I'm, in the I'm in these appointments a lot and I'm waiting a lot for the doctor to come in or the nurse to come in or whatever. And I, I started, I've been drawing on this paper for a long time. And then I, started, I said to myself, I need to make these like official drawings. So I started stealing rolls from the clinic and I made these drawings. Their graphite worked into the paper repeatedly just to the point like, to the point where they're so fragile and vulnerable they start to gently tear or sometimes tear significantly. And then I go through with white thread and I kind of connect the dots where the tears are and try to repair them. But this kind of act of repair also hundreds of times with the sewing machine adds more holes. So I'm like, I'm ripping them, but also repairing them. And it's like this delicate balance of vulnerability and fragility. Um, and so this is the work that's been collected by museums as um, like an innovation in drawing, a drawing technique. And yeah, so that's what this series is there. It's, I just call it the fragility series. They're all untitled, but they're graphite on clinic paper with thread. And I think that's fascinating because one of the things that we both experienced pre-transplant with our lung disease is, you know, they would, they would put us on hypertonic saline infusions and it would dry out your mouth and dry out your sinuses. And then you'd have to drink a bunch of stuff. And when you coughed, it would cause you to cough really hard. And I would cough up blood. So I can't imagine with your chronic hemoptysis, what kind of stuff. So that's the tearing and fixing. And then the, the fixing tears it a little bit more. You know, every medication that we were on for, like I developed mycobacterium avium complex, which is the lung disease or the infection that people with HIV AIDS get. And I had a drug resistant MAC. And so they put me on these big antibiotics. Well, then I ended up with thrush and had some other resistance patterns that were because of the antibiotics that I was on. So that cyclic mm -hmm. fix, the fix does more harm, really resonates. And also too, I just, I found, I, I, it's kind of like an inside joke with me that this is supposed to be, it's made to be trash and you just throw it away. And again, like the anonymity of who's sitting on it and then you rip it and throw it away. And so like I basically convinced museums to buy trash and I thought that was really funny. And like to caretake this material, it really, it reacts to the humidity in the air. So uh, like skin in a weird way, like um, it was on at the RISD museum on display for a month, but depending on what kind of humidity was going on in the room, it wrinkles more when there's more humidity and flattens out when it's drier. And so it, it, has, it, like, it has a lot of reactivity to it. And they're mounted to the wall and they hang. 
and the paper's so light when a viewer walks by, they billow in the air and make that kind of crinkly sound. So you're getting that hospital experience in a museum, and which is like a, a, a thing that I like to do to, to the viewers, like kind of put them in that, in that space. All right, so this, we're gonna talk about your work and then we're gonna talk about your work and then we'll take some questions. So why don't you talk about this project? Um, this one's called Suit. It's, um, I'm wearing it there. This is a, a suit made out of hospital gowns. I made this in 2019. Um, it, and it's just kind of talking about this, almost like a, I don't wanna say graduation, that kind of trivializes it a little bit, but in a way, it's like a, a reset of the expectations and the responsibilities. Growing up with CF, I there was never anything expected of me. Just staying alive was, you know, being a, a superhero. And then, you know, I got older, I got married, then I um, had my transplant, and then, you know, and so I, I started to have like this longevity staring me in the face, and treatments for CF got better, and now they have gene modifiers that are doing incredible things. And so I was always kind of outrunning my life expectancy. And so this suit kind of speaks to that, like this notion that no longer laying passively in the bed, being a patient, now I'm a responsible person. And like this oscillation between patienthood and being, I, I, I say real life, but that's weird, uh, like responsible life, I guess, or or working life or whatever it may be. And, and it's like this, this kind of uh, balance in a way. It's like a costume that you, I can go between both worlds. You would talk, I can't remember which talk, but about, you know, it gets back to the number of pills you take that like being a patient's a job. You have to schedule it. It takes up a certain amount of time just like a job. And this is sort of your going to work Outfit. Yeah, exactly, yep. Yeah. Yeah. So for you, since you're teaching, um, part of the reason I do what I do, um, and I talked about this last night, is because I remember the doctors coming in and being sort of indifferent to me because I was in a teaching hospital. They would look at my symptoms and I had a large spleen before it was removed and they would tap me and talk about me and leave. And, and I always talk about the fact that you know, I remember the doctors that have done procedures on me. I can picture their faces, but they wouldn't know who I was at all. So now you're on the teaching side and you've had this experience of being on the table. So how, what are you, what are you trying to convey to the med students so that they are a little more empathetic and understand what a patient goes through? So when I, when I tell medical students about my experience, um, the room is very quiet. Uh, we have this foundations of clinical practice that we use for our first and second year students. Um, and I speak, uh, I have spoken, it's not annual, but I have spoken to many of the classes, um, especially when we start doing some of the uh, empathy or the, you know, making sure that we're treating the patient as a person, as an individual. Um, I did a, a video for the Indiana State Fair back in 2019, I think, and the physician who runs FCP uses my video during every October's session. And I just found out about that. I didn't know that he'd been doing that, and he's been doing it for a few years now. Um, so I think part of what I try to do, and I hope I tried to do this even before I had the patient experience of being um, a transplant patient, but I think one of the things that is our job as medical educators is to help students look beyond this is a patient, this is the splenomegaly guy, rather than, you know, this is the guy with this and, and look at your disease as what you have and are suffering from and are dealing with as a, as a person, not looking at the patient as the disease. Um, and I know when I went through medical school, I didn't hear that language very much. And I went through medical school in the, in the early to mid nineties. Uh, but I think we've done a better job as medical educators over 
the last few decades of really emphasizing the patient experience and the patient as an individual and making sure that our medical students address people by Ms., Mr., their first name, whatever the patient prefers, to make them very aware that this is a person, a whole person, who has all of these life experiences that you need to find out about. And we encourage our, our second year medical students to just go sit and talk to a patient. You know, it's not, don't go, don't go do the physical exam. I want you to just talk. I want you to come back and tell me like where they went on vacation and where they grew up and, you know, some of those experiences. And I think by emphasizing that to our very young, early doctors, hopefully they will retain that. And I think it's our job as senior faculty to talk to them about that aspect of the individual patient, not just the disease state, and to really consider the patient as a whole. So I, and I'm, I mentioned this last night too, that you know something that could be routine for a doctor, I mean, not that what either of you went through is routine, but your doctors have done it before. Whereas for you guys, it could very well be the major event of your life, other than your marriage, of course. Um, and there's such a, a difference. Like to you, it's the major thing in your life to the doctor doing it. It's, he probably did four of them that week. And how do, you, how do you approach that with the med students so they don't start thinking of it as just a routine? Because it's kind of a miracle. When I was a kid, nobody was getting transplants like this. The transplant experience, I think, is still viewed as a pretty awesome thing. So I don't, I don't think any of the medical teams around transplant treat it as routine yet. Um, my transplant surgeon is no longer at IU, but messages me on Facebook, texts me on my transplant anniversary every year. Um, he doesn't have to do that but he still does. So, you know, he very much makes the individual person connection. Um, I think it's probably more common around chronic illness before you get to transplant. I think making sure that medical students don't see the 12 year old with CF, they see Dom. Oh, by the way, he's a 12 year old with cystic fibrosis. You know, how's he doing in school? Does he have friends? How's his growth? Because with cystic fibrosis, you're really little. Didn't go so well for me. Yeah, right. You're taller than me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, most chronic illnesses were not very big. Yeah. And so um, ha I think really emphasizing, again, that whole person experience. And we spend the entire first year teaching them to relate to patients in our foundations of clinical practice. You know, we might do a little bit of physical diagnosis, but that first year is really about the patient relationship, the doctor-patient relationship, developing trust, showing empathy, um, communication skills. We do entire modules on how to introduce yourself to a patient. The eye contact, sit down. Don't stand at the patient's bedside, sit down. Like, I think one of the big differences from when I was a kid, the doctor used to walk in with a big pile of notes and your medical history. And now, sometimes they even look at it outside the door before they even walk in. They've already, you know, it used to be while they were looking, oh, how are you, what's up? Now it's like that part of it's gone. Or they're looking at a monitor in your room. The electronic medical record has its good and bad points because sometimes they are looking at the monitor while they're talking to you. Um, but it does centralize things so that they can find information much more quickly. Um, they can see you know, what teams have been there earlier that day, what tests are ordered for you, that sort of thing. But, uh, but I, I really think the, the emphasis in medical education in the early years has, the doctors have, have realized, the medical system has realized that, you know, it can't be, this is number four this week. It still has to be, this is Deborah Rusk. She is whatever. And so I think by changing the focus of medical education from when I went through it, that 
these young physicians will maintain those skills because they are being so emphasized. They'll maintain them throughout their practice. So you were working in PEDS before, right? Emergency medicine, um, but the pediatric emergency department and then the all-comer county hospital. So how did you, this is always my final question for everybody. What, what made you suited for that? Why did you pick that specialty? So I came to medical school thinking I wanted to be an obstetrician. And I found that with every delivery, I was like, ooh, baby. And I would like follow the baby to the warmer rather than really focused on, on the mom and such. And so I, like, I was one of those third year students who liked everything and really had a hard time picking what specialty I wanted to be. And there's a combined residency in internal medicine and pediatrics. So I was like, oh great, I can see the whole age spectrum. I don't have to decide if I wanna be a hospitalist or be an outpatient, I'm gonna do this. So I didn't really decide what I wanted to be. I chose something that would allow me to do almost anything I wanted, except surgery. Um, and I should have known myself a little bit better. I was a little more of an adrenaline junkie than an outpatient clinical practice was suited for. Um, and after about three or four years, I was growing tired and bored of an outpatient clinical practice and started moonlighting in some emergency departments. And that's really when I found my true calling. Emergency medicine wasn't a, a, a focus. I mean, I went to medical school in the days that ER was just starting on TV. So a lot of medical centers didn't have emergency medicine. It was internal medicine, peds, and surgery that managed the emergency department. So I had no exposure to emergency medicine. And when I found it, it really was one of those aha moments. I have found the population I love serving. I found the environment I love serving. I have found the, the people I love working with. Um, you never knew what was coming through the door. And I found that satisfying that I could treat anything that walked in. I could stabilize. I might not be able to take out your appendix or I might not be able to, you know, take you to the cath lab if you're having a big heart attack, but I can stabilize you until somebody can come in who can do that. And there's a lot of satisfaction in that. I used to joke with my husband that within three to four hours, my patients were either home, admitted, or dead. And there wasn't anything, you know, the long-term stuff. Um, so I found emergency medicine and that's really what my passion was and the ability to be, to make decisions quickly, to develop trust with patients fairly rapidly, um, and kind of being that resuscitation expert and a little bit of a jack of all trades is the, the breadth of it really fits me. That's great. All right, so this ties into the work in the back. This is Dominic Scar. I don't know if he even remembers it. We did it years ago. We did this on the live performance, right? Yeah. yeah. You want to say I, I, anything I never about saw it, it finished. Oh, I, well, there it is. <laughs> so I did a couple, and I, you know, some of them, the, the lungs were sort of more defined, but I decided that they should look wacky like that. Do you have any sort of creative outlet? We've been talking about Dominic's work. Do you do? She told me she's scared. I did. <laughs> I, I am. And I told Dom this when, when we were, let me use the mic. Oh, sorry. I told Dom this when we were looking through your art back there. Um, so amazing. And, and I'd seen his on his website again. So amazing. Um, and I'm a little jealous. A lot jealous, actually. Because I really don't have, I've never, I've never, investigated that creative, creative side of me. I don't know if, it's exi if it exists. I hope it does to some degree. And he was talking about starting art for transplant patients. And I said to him, you need to be prepared for people like me who are gonna walk into you and go, this sounds so cool. How do I do it? Where do I start? I, I, don't, I don't have this outlet and I'm, I'm jealous. Well, you can take his class when he's I know. Are there any questions for our esteemed panel here? I guess not. I'll jump in. Okay. So thank you all for this presentation and really sharing so much of yourself and of another to us. So you talked a lot about yourself individually and 
in the experience, and, and then you share highlights of that care team around you, and I'm speaking of that intimate care team that you have. Can you share a little bit more about the experience that they went through on this journey? Where Dom, this was from childhood, and and then Dr. Ross with you, uh, having been married and uh, having colleagues, and so can you share that with us? What was that like with? And you, because you mentioned some isolation, but then folks came in and helped with that. Uh, for me. Um yeah, so like my mom was my primary caregiver growing up, and she was um, she instilled in me the taking responsibility for my own health care and being my own advocate, even though, like I told you guys, I'm a pushover and I let anybody do anything. <laughs> um, but it, it kind of helped me become more responsible and know about the as much as I could understand about my own disease my own medications and why I need them and when, you know, that kind of thing. So that obviously, I think, played a major part in my um, longevity as a person with cystic fibrosis. Um, uh, and so, you know, that that's kind of where my foundation came from. Uh, and then I, two amazing sisters that also participated in that and um, a few close friends. But for the most part, I kept as much as I could, CF pretty private. So I have friends from high school that didn't know I had CF until I got my transplant, you know, so. Um, and, and then, you know, I met my wife after I graduated college and kind of, um, you know, ruined her life. But, <laughs> uh, yeah, she, you know, she's very caring and, you know, we actually met at a very weird time in each, in our lives. Um, she was going through a cancer scare. And so we went on a first date and then second date we were uh, at a dinner and she was like, she didn't seem herself like her, like our first date. And so I, I was like, what's going on? And she finally, I, I, I was like, you can tell me like, she didn't know I had CF at the time. So she's like, well, I, I'm having some uh, major health issue. Uh, I, I, I might went, have I'm going to marry you. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, that's, that's awesome. I have cystic fibrosis. <laughs> and so we kind of bonded w weirdly over that. And, um, you know, she obviously has been through hell and back with my disease. I, I've almost died twice. I've been in two comas with while we've been together. And, um, you know, so it's very long and I do my best to support her and what she needs to do. And, um, you know, we find ways to find other points of support through other family members, friends. We go, we travel a lot. That's our biggest passion. So when we're, when I'm feeling healthy enough to travel, we, we travel as much as we can. And, um, you know, there are obviously times when it gets really hard. We were both very isolated up in uh, San Francisco during my transplant time, you know, for as much, as, as much support as I had, the attention was all on me. She was kind of always there in the background, but overlooked a lot. So I made sure to tell my mom or her friends, like, just text them like, Hey, send a care package to Deb and stuff like that. Something that I couldn't do because it would look like trivial, I think, but you know, so it's th those kind of ways to, to, to support one another, but you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard and you know, um, yeah, so that's kind of. So as a kid through my illness, my mom was the major support person. My mom was a single mom for several years with me. So it was really just us. Um, but she, she was very smart in that she never limited me or told me that I should be limited by my lung disease. And then, like I said, through teens and twenties, I did great. Um, you know, my husband's in the room, so I'm going to call him out a little bit. He's probably thrilled. Uh, I don't, did you know I had lung disease when we started dating? I didn't think so. So, you know, we started dating in our mid twenties and got married in our late twenties. Um, and at that point I was, I mean, I remember us buying bicycles together while we were still dating and I could bike and go wherever we wanted to go. Um, and then as I, as my health declined, he became 
my major support person. And I, I, I was to the point I couldn't pull a suitcase even on wheels through an airport. And we had two really school age, early teenage boys when I went through my major decline. And I can remember I was taking my youngest son somewhere and he was 15 or 16. And I remember Brad grabbing Taggart and saying to him, mom carries nothing. You wait for her, you open door, you know, and just really making him very aware. Not that he wasn't aware, but really driving it home for him. Look, you're taking my role here. So here's what you're going to do. And it was just tagging. And I can't remember where we were going, but I do remember hearing that, overhearing that conversation. Um, he would make excuses for me when people would call if they invited us to do something that he didn't think I was capable of. It, rightly so. He would be like, oh, you know, she's working late that night or I'm gone or we've got plans. And so he really didn't put me in a position where I would be pushed. He let me sign us up for things or try. And then through the transplant, uh, I mentioned my best friend, my mom and my husband as being the major people that were there. And my mom was a nurse, an old nurse, and she did a very smart thing in that she set up a schedule. She's like, look, it's going to fall to the three of us. We will never be here together. And so every day I had a schedule that I could actually look at and I knew what time Julie was going to get there and what time my mom was going to get there and what time Brad was going to get there. And, and it was really a case where Brad would walk in and Julie would kiss me and leave. And, you know, and my dad showed up every once in a while as a two hour interim type person to cover something. But, um, between the three of them, they set this schedule without my knowing it. They, they had had like this little meeting and set it up. I just thought they set up the schedule. Cool. Um, but they were the ones that, that su supported me throughout the entire, entire experience. And they, those three are probably still my biggest support, um, for this and look out for me, you know, mulch gets delivered and Julie comes to my house and I move into her house for two days, you know, cause mulch is deadly. Um, those sorts of things, you know, but it, it takes, it takes a village to get through that. So you, Dominic is one of the few couples where you and your wife have both been in comas. You had to go through watching your wife recently, forgot, with, with COVID I can't remember any time period, but it was yeah. in the last couple of years, so, right? So um, yeah, my wife and I, um, we, after, well, we kind of talked about kids before we, um, before I had my transplant. And uh, with cystic fibrosis, 97% of men don't have vas deferens, so um, can't have kids naturally. So I had sperm extraction pre-transplant just to kind of cover any um, toxicity from the post-transplant meds. And when we were doing IVF, we she found, found out that she had fibroids. And so the first attempt on IVF didn't work because of the fibroids. She had those removed, but during the removal process, there was an issue with the, with that. And, um, she ended up crashing and going and, and they put her into a medical induced coma for two days. And so I, she woke up and I was like, now we're even, you know, so, and she's like, now, you know what I went through twice. And so it kind of like weirdly made us a stronger couple. And, um, anyway, now we have a three-year-old son now and he's, he's, he's amazing. But, um, yeah, I mean, if we've, we've kind of lived this weirdly medicalized life this whole time. Do you want to say, and you don't have to, but you had to watch her go through all this and I heard you were in the room while they were doing the transplant. I wasn't in the, the exact uh, room, the, the surgery room. Um, we, were, we were all there, we were focused in the hospital at that time. Um, long, I don't know if it was quite as long as Dominic's, but and a half, but it was a long day. Um, but leading up to it, um, because when she went in the hospital, I kind of moved into the room with her. So for, I was there 24-7 um, on a cot in the room. And uh, our oldest was away at school. Our youngest was in high school, um, able to drive. So he kind of took care of himself. But um, there, was never a, a, there was never a fear of losing her. I, there was one moment, that was literally the night, the night or two nights before the actual operation, when they said, hey, 
set of lungs were in. And uh, so we had a moment saying, it's like, we had talked about certain things, and I'm not going to say it, but it's like, all of a sudden, you have this chat about what if, and it was like, we both kind of lost it, because we never talked about it. And uh, so we really didn't that moment. We did a little bit, and then moved on. Um, a lot of support, like Deb mentioned, but she also, um, she has a large group of, of friends in medical and outside of medical. So we had guests in, and we actually controlled the guests. We never wanted more than one person in the room at a time. So we kind of regulate that. Um, since then, a lot, all of our friends and family, all are very aware of her lungs, her lung anniversary. So it's, a, it's very much an annual gathering to celebrate that. Um, she did, I do want you, Ted, you asked her a question. I didn't like her answer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's not my fault. <laughs> when she went into the hospital, how was she a good patient or how did she take that? Well, her doctor, Dr. Rowe, I can remember vividly on the first moment I think that I met him, um, he, he flat out told her, he said, let's get a few things straight. You are the patient, you are not the doctor, you are not the, and uh, so he was really good. And Deb was always a good patient leading up to this moment. But when it came to that end journey, um, he did a fabulous job of communicating to her and us that your number one goal is you. So you can, and she was very polite and all the, the doctors and nurses and surgeons, but he did a really good job of just always being very direct. And uh, that was refreshing. So I'm a big fan of this. Did you want to see your charts and things during all this, or did you? Um, I wanted to see my labs every day. <laughs> I want, some of the things that I was following, you can probably hear me. Some of the things that, that they were having trouble with, I'm like, so what's the level today? You know, what's, what's my hemoglobin? What's my creatinine? Um, because those had started to creep up and down the bad directions. Um, so I had, I wanted that sort of thing. I didn't want to read my chart. I didn't necessarily want to know what, you know, people were saying. Difficult patients. Right, right. <laughs> but I did, I wanted, I wanted the numbers. I wanted to know every day what my numbers were doing. I was very focused on, like when I was on pressors, how much presser was I on and what was my blood pressure doing and how much oxygen was I requiring. So I, I think it, I went into clinical mode a little bit as a protective mechanism. I got a question to you. At Stanford, after transplant, they allow you to hold your lungs in the, um, in the lab. Did, did you get to do that? Did not, oh, yeah. but I did send my team in with an Instamatic camera because I wanted to see yeah. what was happening, and so I have the the picture images of you know my open chest cavity that's em empty, the mediastinum you can see, wow. but the you know the lung fields it looks like a turkey carcass because my my <laughs> scar is not the midline scar like you see in his. I have what's called the clamshell, so it's kind of like an underwire bra scar. And then it just, they opened me this way. Well, thank you both for opening up and showing us your art and talking about your career.